There's a solitary, humble, wooden structure on a windswept hill in rural New England. To open the door is to engage our minds, our hearts, and our imaginations. In this place, preachers and professors, past and present, come alive as they walk the aisle, ascend the pulpit stairs, and teach. From theology, from history, and from the Word of God, welcome to the Saybrook Meeting House an audio production of Saybrook Ministries. What's your experience in court? I've been in traffic court. Uh, I've been in civil court as an observer for an insurance company during a civil trial. I've been in Superior Court uh, representing my employer in um, theft of proprietary property. And I've been in criminal court as a foreman on a jury. When somebody says you've got a court appointment, that's, it's usually not good news. At best, it's usually uh, something that's going to be stressful and time-consuming at best. At worst, of course, it can reflect a tragic turn of events in your life or in the life of a loved one. But today, as we continue our study of the tabernacle, we're going to be seeing that the courtyard of the tabernacle, or sometimes just called the court, was a blessed reprieve. It was a means for the children of God, children of Israel rather, to relate to God and to interact, to be taught about their sin, to be taught about the need for an atonement, and to see visually expressed concepts and ideas and practices that they could hold on to while contemplating the promised Messiah, who would one day bring everlasting relief and comfort to humanity's sin problem. So today's text is Exodus 27, verses 9 through 19. Exodus 27, 9 through 19. Again, these were the instructions that came to Moses directly from God on Mount Sinai. He said, this you will do, and so they did. So these directions about the court of the tabernacle come directly from Yahweh, from God, through Moses. You shall make the court of the tabernacle. This is verses 9 through 19. You shall make the court of the tabernacle. On the south side, the court shall have hangings of fine twined linen, a hundred cubits long for one side. Its twenty pillars and their twenty bases shall be of bronze, but the hooks of the pillars and their fillets shall be of silver. And likewise, for its length on the north side, there shall be hangings a hundred cubits long, its pillars twenty, and their bases twenty, of bronze. But the hooks of the pillars and their fillets shall be of silver. And for the breadth of the court on the west side, there shall be hangings for fifty cubits, with ten pillars and ten bases. The breadth of the court on the front to the east shall be 50 cubits. The hangings for the one side of the gate shall be 15 cubits, with their three pillars and three bases. On the other side, the hangings shall be 15 cubits, with their three pillars and three bases. For the gate of the court, there shall be a screen 20 cubits long of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen embroidered with needlework. It shall have four pillars and with them four bases. All the pillars around the court shall be filleted with silver. Their hooks shall be of silver and their bases of bronze. The length of the court shall be a hundred cubits, the breadth fifty, and the height five cubits, with hangings of fine twined linen and bases of bronze. 
and the, all the utensils of the tabernacle for every use, and all its pegs, and all the pegs of the court shall be of bronze. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of His Word. All right, this morning I want to share two minor points and one major point. Uh, these are in your uh, bulletin outline, and you can do fill in the blank. I know that helps some people uh, pay attention and follow along. So minor point number one is this. In the courtyard of the tabernacle, we see that salvation and worship are inseparably united. In the court of the tabernacle, we see that salvation and worship are inseparably united. There's a Bible scholar by the name of Henry Soltau, and in the middle 19th century, he wrote two extensive studies, several hundred pages each, detailing uh, every aspect of the tabernacle setup, construction, and symbolism. And he helps bring us back to the mind's eye that the Israelites would have had in the desert. And he said this, the Israelite who entered through the gate of the court would be encompassed, shut in, and protected by the hanging of fine twined linen. Though in a wilderness, he stood on holy ground. And the fine linen by which he was surrounded shut out from his eye the dreary, barren prospect through which he was wending his way. Remember, it was 40 years. The lovely tabernacle of God stood partially revealed to his gaze. The courts of the Lord's house, overshadowed by the cloud of glory, were before him. The altar, with its lamb for the burnt offering, sent up an odor of a sweet savor on his behalf. The laver, filled with water, told him of a fountain filled with life and purity, which would cleanse away even the ordinary defilement contracted while passing through a wilderness of death. He had entered, again, this is from the perspective of an Israelite entering the court. He had entered through the gate of the court, the appointed doorway. Within, every object proclaimed light, peace, righteousness, acceptance, and nearness to God. Well might the psalmist say, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. That's Psalm 84. Moreover, he says, no deadly foe could enter those precincts. The presence of the living God manifested over the ark of His strength was there. The hosts of his people encamped in close and well-ordered ranks all around. And the court of the tabernacle itself was screened even from the gaze of an adversary. Thus, this court presented a place of security, of holiness, and of communion with God. That's minor point number one. Minor point number two. As with all elements of the tabernacle, the courtyard and its relation to the rest of the structure are redemptively and prophetically significant. As with all elements of the tabernacle, the courtyard and its relation to the rest of the structure are redemptively and prophetically significant. Many of you know Matthew Henry one of the most famous Bible commentators in history. And he concurs with the vast majority of Bible scholars when he says this, the court was a type. Now when someone says type like that, what they mean is representation. The court was a type of the church. Enclosed and distinguished from the rest of the world, the enclosure supported by pillars, denoting the stability of the church, hung with the clean linen, which is said to be the righteousness of the saints. These were the courts David longed for and coveted to reside in when he wrote Psalm 84, and into which the people of God entered with praise and thanksgiving. 
We read that in Psalm 100 as we opened the sermon uh, service today. Yet this court, at that point in history, Matthew says, would have just a few worshipers on average during the ongoing daily activity. He says, thanks be to God, now under the Gospel, the enclosure is taken down. God's will is that men pray everywhere, and there is room for all that in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? Additionally, we see something interesting here. We see a progression of increasing holiness from the court to the most holy place to the holy of holies. Remember that central enclosure, that building in the middle of the court, contains the most holy place and the holy of holies. The bread table, the candlestick is in the most holy place. What's in the holy of holies? Remember? What item is in the Holy of Holies? The Ark of the Covenant. And remember in the description that God gave Moses, we started there. We started with the items before we got to the tent. Because the Lord said, I'm going to explain to you the center of holiness here, the Ark of the Covenant, and then we're going to build out from there. But we see this progression of holiness. And so in the outer court, you could have worshiper and priest. In the most holy place, you could have priest, but you can't have the regular worshiper. In the holy of holies, you can only have the high priest. And you can only have the high priest how many times a year? Once, on the Day of Atonement. And there's an interesting uh, parallel here where the dimensions, again, God is giving all this detail to Moses. The dimensions of the Holy of Holies is a perfect cube. And we see that that's significant in the Scripture. It's the same dimension on all sides. What other object other than, so there's a Holy of Holies. It's a perfect cube. What other object do we see that is of preeminent prophetic significance in the New Testament that's a perfect cube? The New Jerusalem. You read in Revelation that the New Jerusalem, in all its holiness and grandeur and splendor, is also a perfect cube. So the fact that the tabernacle court was oblong, we read that it was 100 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, it's a rectangle, gives us a hint that this is transitory. This is not permanent. There's gradations here. And the Holy of Holies gives us that picture of like one day, the permanent, the holy, the forever, the eternal is going to be in the New Jerusalem. So there's a method and a meaning for everything that God is telling Moses here in this blueprint. And that leads me to my major point. Because of Christ, while the center remains no less holy, the courtyard has become greatly enlarged due to a newer, better covenant. One more time, because of Christ, while the center remains no less holy, the courtyard has become greatly enlarged due to a newer, better covenant. James shared from Daniel Hyde's book, which uh, I highly recommend on the tabernacle. It's called God in Our Midst. And he makes the point that the Lord's courtyard provided a place of permanence, but it was only semi-permanent and looked forward to a day of true permanence. God knows the needs of His people. He knows we are weak. He knows we need permanence, stability, and structure. And Hyde goes on to say this. He says, I hope you're saying to yourself, but we don't live in Jerusalem. There is no temple. We don't live in the desert. There is no tabernacle courtyard. Can there be any permanence for us, given that Exodus describes what happened so long ago? We find the answer in John chapter 4, John's Gospel chapter 4, 
which records a conversation that our Lord had with a woman. Now, Jesus was a Jew, and this woman was a Samaritan. What's a Samaritan? A Samaritan was part of a a mixed race created by the Assyrians who wanted to breed out the Jews from their land. There was no shortage of acrimony between those parties. And part of the conversation between Jesus and this Samaritan woman went like this in John chapter 4, starting at verse 20. The woman said, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. So here's the point. Under the new covenant, the permanence that was foreshadowed by a localized, circumscribed, fenced tabernacle has now taken root in the hearts of believers everywhere. Through the prophet Jeremiah, the Lord said this. Some of you have heard this. Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke. Though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Listen to the intimacy there. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Now that gets an amen. Now listen to the words of Jesus at the institution of the Lord's Supper, which had formerly been designated as the Passover meal. This cup, Jesus says, is poured, that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. That's Luke 22. And finally, the Apostle Paul amplifies this same message as he talks to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians. He tells them, God has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives Life. Now, if the ministry of death, Paul says, carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. So what he's saying here is, when the finger, the very finger of God etched those commandments, those commandments are righteous, pure, holy, and we ought to have lived up to them. But because we can't, and most of us haven't uh, fulfilled, have broken the Ten Commandments, if not indeed, at least in our heart, every waking day of our lives. That's why Paul says it's a ministry of death. There's nothing wrong with the Ten Commandments, but to you who couldn't keep them, it's a ministry of death because it leaves you under condemnation. So what is your hope? The hope is the new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ. 
who says, nevertheless, I know, Ben, that you couldn't keep it for five minutes at a time. I kept it, and I kept it on your behalf. And if you trust in me and you follow me, you're part of the fold, and you're within this tabernacle courtyard that's now worldwide. So to conclude and uh, bring home this concept of the new covenant, I wanted to revisit, some of you were here when we were going through Hebrews, and I preached on Hebrews chapter 8, and I shared a little bit uh, from John Owen, uh, and I, I bragged on jo John Owen a lot during that series. He's uh, the prince of the Puritans. He's, um, uh, his Hebrews commentary is magisterial, and one of the reasons I have a lot of respect for him is that he uh, experienced the highest highs and the lowest lows from losing 10 of 11 kids in infancy and the one that survived predeceased him. Wrap your mind around that for a second. To be utterly committed to Christ, though he slay me, one kid, two kids, three kids, four kids, five kids, that alone is remarkable. This is a guy who, because of the the uh, vicissitudes of politics and the church being uh, wane, waning and waxing as far as who was in charge at that time. He was in great political prominence. He preached before Parliament. And at other times, he was being kicked out as Dean of Oxford. So he's felt the lowest lows, and he's felt the highest highs with razor-sharp focus on Christ the whole time and blessed with an incredible intellect. So I commend to you, without reservation, John Owen. Now, John Owen thinks in Latin. That was the predominant language of scholarship at the time. As a consequence, he writes a lot of run-on sentences. Okay? He is dense. It's not necessarily hard to read, but it's dense. Now, run-on sentences, you know, are a grammatical no-no. We get that. It's axiomatic. Here's the exception, unless John Owen writes them. Because when John Owen writes them, these clauses are so pregnant with meaning and goodness that I, I give him a pass on it. Now, Owen has a wonderful summary of the new covenant that's a run-on sentence. He didn't outline it for you. I outlined it for you so we can understand it a little bit better. Okay? I'm going to read it twice. Here it goes. The new covenant collecting into one all the promises of grace given from the foundation of the world, accomplished in the actual exhibition of Christ, and confirmed in his death and by the sacrifice of his blood, and thereby becoming the sole rule of new spiritual ordinances of worship suited unto it, was the great object of the faith of the saints of the Old Testament, and is the great foundation of all our present mercies. One more time. The new covenant, collecting into one all the promises of grace given from the foundation of the world, accomplished in the actual exhibition of Christ, and confirmed in His death and by the sacrifice of His blood, and thereby becoming the sole rule of new spiritual ordinances of worship suited unto it, was the great object of the faith of the saints of the Old Testament, and is the great foundation of all our present mercies. Owen explains, and with this we'll close, the new covenant was a recapitulation a re-summarizing or restating of all promises of grace. There was no promise of God, no hint or indication of His love or grace toward the church in general, nor toward any particular believer that was not brought into the new covenant. Now what he's saying there is he's simply saying what Jesus said is, all those promises in me are yea and amen. All those are not null and void. In Christ, they're yea and amen. He says, therefore, all the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with all the other patriarchs and the oath of God by which they were confirmed are all made to us 
and belong to us no less than they belong to those to whom they were first given, if we are made partakers of this covenant. There's your conditional phrase. In other words, if we believe and trust in Christ. Everything that was of love and grace was gathered up into this new covenant. The actual exhibition of Christ in the flesh belonged to this promise of making a new covenant. For without it, it could not have been made. This was the desire of all the faithful from the foundation of the world. This they longed after and fervently prayed for continually. And the prospect of it, he says, was the sole ground or foundation of their joy and consolation. You remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. And then what does Jesus say? He saw it and was glad. Owen concludes, that view which they had by faith of the King of saints in His beauty and glory, though it was at a great distance, was their relief and their reward in their sincere obedience. And those who do not understand the glory of this privilege of the new covenant in the incarnation of the Son of God, or His exhibition in the flesh, in which the depths of the counsels and wisdom of God in the way of grace, mercy, and love open to themselves unto the church are strangers unto the things of God. He says they're people who don't get it and are hard of heart. And he closes with this. The new covenant was confirmed and ratified by the death and blood shedding of Christ and therefore the whole work of His mediation is included in it. This is the spring of the life of the church. The peace, the assurance, the light, the joy that depend on Christ's work and proceed from Christ's work, no tongue can express. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we realize that in our sometimes hard and feeble hearts and minds, it's difficult for us to fully grasp this drama of redemption that you planned out. That like a tender father, you spoke through Moses to the children of Israel. Children that you knew were rebellious, were continually rebellious, and would rebel in the future. And yet, your kindness, you stooped down and said, I am going to teach my children, Israel, who I am and the mission of my Son that is going to save them by this structure in the middle of the desert. And they're going to see day in and day out as they look at this pillar of cloud and pillar of fire and this courtyard with white linen and angels sewn into it representing the very presence of God where all the saints and angels continually eternally say holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. You taught them in your kindness. You stooped down like a loving father. You gave us a language. You gave us visuals. You gave us physical representations. All of which, in your sovereignty, pointed to the person and work of Christ. So we praise you for that this morning and we thank you for that. We thank you that even this morning in our mind's eye, because of this heat, it's not hard to picture ourselves with those Israelites out in the desert wondering where God is going to lead them under this heat and in these strange circumstances. So Lord, I pray that your 
this, the fold of your tabernacle would continue to increase. We thank you that your work goes forward around the globe this morning, that even this morning you're drawing people to yourself around the globe who will one day join the company of saints and angels that are already in your presence. We praise you and thank you for the truth of the tabernacle and for the truth of the Son of God. And we pray all these things in your name. Amen. Thank you for joining us this week at the Saybrook Meeting House. We hope you've been blessed by today's podcast. Saybrook Ministries' mission is to provide didactic and devotional content from the Christian faith delivered to the saints, recovered and refined by the Protestant Reformation. Be sure to visit saybrookministries.org for continually updated Christian content designed to inspire and invigorate our imagination and intellect. Join us next week for another journey to the Saybrook Meeting House. Until then, may God bless you.